Well, this should be short and sweet. Um, good evening, board members. My name is Mike New. I'm about two, a little over two weeks on the job at this point. Um, my title is a mouthful, but essentially I was brought in um, from Leander. I worked with uh, Rick Beverly, your city manager, um, in the past to uh, work real close with our, our planning services as well as our engineering department to, to really help usher in a lot of capital projects we have online and, and work through some of the changes that I know we're, we're anticipating with, with zoning and in our comprehensive plan and some of the plans that the city is developing. So I'm here to, to help bridge that and, and, and work with each and every one of you to move things forward. Okay. Is this the position where they, some people were calling chief of staff? This is not the chief of staff okay. position. That is a that position is still unfilled. Okay. All right. Yes, I'm just for clarification. But it's very nice to meet you all. Okay. Thank you. All right. We need to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Did y'all get a copy of them? I make a motion to approve. Okay. Do I have a second? Yes. I do. I second. Okay. All in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. And now I would like to ask Olivia Curency to come forward. I guess I will come, I'll walk around up there. Okay, it's not raining today, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> well, Olivia, for your outstanding service to the city, congratulations. From the 2015-2024, we'd like to receive you as a default. And uh, thank you for your service to the city. Thank and you. I'm not going to close my eyes. And Olivia, if you want to stay for all this fun stuff, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> I see that look on her face. We should have got that picture. <laughs> all right. Um, okay, consideration and possible action to appoint two Zoning Board of Adjustment board members to the newly formed City of Nacogdoches Zoning Ordinance Amendment Committee. Um, this is going to be a new committee from what I've understood. Is that correct? Yes, that's, okay. that's correct. All right. Did you want to speak to that? Mr. Sure. Beecher? I was just going to give a brief outline of okay. what, what it's about. All so right. basically um, there had been some presentations to some tech changes um, to uh, both the planning and zoning and to city council. Um, we ended up having kind of a full docket and um, we were trying to do it all at once. And so it, it became a little bit overwhelming. So what we decided to do is to create um, uh, a subcommittee um, that is going to house uh, folks from the Zoning Board of Adjustment, uh, Planning and Zoning, two members for each, and also City Council. And then um, staff is going to bring forth these text amendments, and we're going to kind of uh, wrestle it out to see where we can get to, get it to a point where we can bring it to City Council for um, adoption. Okay. Um, I did have uh, one board member expressed interest on serving on this. Um, and that was uh, Margaret Forbes, who's joining us. For everyone that needs to know, uh, Margaret Forbes, she goes by Maggie, is joining us by Zoom. So she, we can't see her, but we can tell that she's joining us. Are you there, Maggie? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Did yes, you? I, I'm interested in serving on that subcommittee. Okay. Was there that any? pleases the board. Okay. Um, I would like to serve on that as well. So we get two, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Is there anyone else? Do we need to vote on this? 
Okay. Do we need to vote on that then? Okay. All right. Uh, so far, we have the names of uh, we have Maggie Forbes, we have Rhonda Ward, and we have uh, Sally Ann Swearingen. As an alternate, and I'm just asking this for clarification. As an alternate, does she is that the same consideration as a standing mem as a member? In my opinion, it, it would be, but um, okay. yeah, we just wanted to have input from folks. Um, again, this committee is not going to be making the decision. The decision right. maker it's just is city input. Council. Okay. Just is there anyone else that, that would like to be on that? Okay. I think I need to learn first. Okay. All right. Is Margaret the, uh, the lady so, who was? Sorry, I had a clarification. Is uh -huh. that the alternates were not appointed before to be included in that committee? Okay. So I'm sorry. I, I, okay. I so. Got it wrong. Okay. So we now have Margaret Forbes, Rhonda Ward, Larry. Larry King just joined us. Margaret. Um, yes. For you thank to know. You. Okay, Larry. We have. Uh, we're supposed to appoint two people to the City of Nacogdoches Zoning Ordinance Amendment Committee, yes. and Margaret Forbes is wanting to be on that committee. And I said I would like to be on it as well. There's two people that you can appoint that that I can appoint to that. Do you have any interest in serving in that? Okay, um, she's joining by Zoom. She's right here. She's here. Yeah, she got a little M. That's Margaret. <laughs> okay, um, I guess seeing no other interest or nominations, I guess I would say I would just sub submit uh, Margaret Forbes and Ron Ward then. To okay. All right. Does it need a Does it need a second to appoint? Okay. Okay. All right. I need a. Uh, can I make that motion, or does someone else need to? As the chair. So moved. Okay. Larry made the motion. Second. Second. Okay. Mary and Bentley seconded. All in favor of appointing uh, Margaret Forbes and Ron Ward to the Nacogdoches Zoning Ordinance Amendment Committee, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, any opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right, uh, we're gonna get into the workshop part of our meeting. Um, we're gonna first start with Mr. Dietrich. I did wanna say before we start that I actually called this because we just have, we need clarification and we need uh, some guidance on what we hear and what we don't hear. And I think the last meeting was a uh, we just need clarification on, sure. and, and like I said, and some guidance on what we're doing. So. No problem. Um, and, and before we start, I just wanted to kind of give a brief, uh, just so everyone understands what's in your packet in front of you. So in the left pocket, when you, when you look at it and when you open up your folder, and this is in order, the agenda packet should be paper clipped there. There should be the PowerPoint presentations for this afternoon's meeting and an informational letter with future tentative meeting dates and also a department phone, phone list. And on the right pocket, again, in order, will be the Zoning Board of Adjustment Rules and Procedures. And that's the uh, currently adopted one version. And also the copy of the current uh, zoning ordinance. Okay. Just let me know when you're ready. Okay, just a second. Let me get this. No problem at all. There's the agenda. I want to get that over there. Does everyone have their packets in order then? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You can continue. All right. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. Um, uh, welcome to our board's workshop. And we're very, 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 very glad that you're all here. Um, your input is, uh, is always needed and because uh, you are uh, the guiding light for this particular department. So we, okay. we appreciate you being here for this. Um, I understand that this was something that has not happened in the recent past. I think it was back in 20, maybe 2020 and 2021 when this is the last time it, it's happened, so it's kind of long overdue. And since we have so many new board members, this is kind of a, appropriate for us to have this, uh, this uh, w workshop. And you'll have to forgive me um, and forgive all of us. We don't know where everybody is at in their understanding of everything. So some of it might be remedial, some of it might, might not be. So let's just take it all in. If you have questions or if you can just nod that it's all good, but. We just wanted to make sure that there was a, um, a basic understanding from the start to the finish. Um, so 
taking a moment to introduce myself. I think I said hello to everyone, but again, I'm Nathan Dietrich. I'm a third party consultant working with the uh, community development. I've been around for probably just over or under a year. Um, so, and we have also Jerry Baker here, city attorney, and also Amy with uh, the planning and development department. So, just wanted to say hello. So, for the way that this works, and just again, um, just making sure that everyone understands how this works, is that um, here is kind of a, 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 di a diagram of uh, our local government structure here at the city of Nacogdoches. So the gray tiles um, are show that there's an elected body, um, and while the yellow tiles are appointed bodies, um, which is one of those bodies is, is this, this particular um, this board. Uh, the light blue tiles are legislation, legis legislative functions and generally have more discretion in their decision making. The green tiles are generally administrative or quasi-judicial functions, again, something that you guys do here for us. And then all those uh, ones in yellow are appointed people and can be removed by that same process as they were appointed. Um, and so, but usually the, those documents have some sort of you know, reasoning behind it, whether you've missed one, two, three, or four meetings, and if you need to be there. They just want to have someone that's, you know, going to be on the board so we can have consistent um, meetings for the public. So part of what you are, have been chosen to do is to kind of oversee the, uh, the zoning and the comprehensive plan. So. Part of the, the zoning, um, at its core, is zoning is designed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the city. It's also used to implement the goals and objectives found in our comprehensive plan. Um, it can protect community resources such as farmland and historic and cultural resources. It can also help to maintain community character and aesthetic. <coughs> Excuse me. To promote desirable patterns of development and to protect public and private investment. So zoning regulations, as you see here on the map, that is a, a, a snippet of our, our zoning map that we have here at, at the city. And then also the legend that what, the, um, which zone it represents. So the zoning regulations are adopted by ordinance and contain two different components, the map and the text. The map divides the community into different districts as, such as residential, commercial, industrial, agricultural, and conservancy. The text describes the uses that are allowed within each of those districts. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say what I'm about to say, but some people don't know that this, our, our mapping system, our, our what, what is referred to as geographic information systems, mm -hmm. it's something that's available for everyone to use. Uh, and also you as a, as a board member and also as a citizen. Um, because of time today, I won't go through how to access it, but if you don't know how to, um, I would recommend because it has such a wealth of information and data that you can look at. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just shows you a really different picture of the city if, you, if you're not familiar. So if, you, if you're interested, um, staff would be happy to walk you through how to, how to navigate it and how to go on to it. So zoning, what zoning can regulate? Um, zoning regulates height, where what we refer to in the zoning ordinance is property development standards. It, um, it's height, which includes number of stories, size of buildings, and other structures, accessory and primary. Percentage of lot that might be occupied by hard surface area. Size of yards, courts, and other open spaces um, that might be community uh, driven or, or park related. Uh, population density and how many uh, units can be uh, provided per acre. It also um, dictates the location and use of buildings in some cases and, uh, and those other structures and land for business, industrial, and residential. It oversees the construction in areas of historical, cultural, and architectural importance. A lot of the times those are referred to as overlays. Um, we in, in this city have uh, a number of overlays and Again, that's something that you can view from our GIS if you're, if you're ever interested, and also a historical area. Uh, and again, um, the, it can also uh, dictate the bulk of the building for mass and scale and how it looks across the board. So now we come uh, down to you, you as a board of adjustment. 
you are the overseers of, of the zoning um, the zoning code. So if someone were to want you to appeal the decision that's made by us as staff, then they would come to you, uh, forward to you as a board. So you're referred to as a quasi-judicial body, um, which is, means that you're somewhat of a judicial body that, that uh, dictates rules and regulations, and your, your answer um, does not, cannot be appealed to city council. It would go directly to uh, district court. You deal with zoning issues by, on a parcel by parcel basis. And um, one thing that I think from my interaction with this, uh, with this board and previous members of the board is that it's always very difficult, especially if you know folks in, the, in, your, in your community and you're on one of these boards, it's always very difficult to say no and to the neighbors that want these exceptions to the zoning ordinance. But I, I felt that this board has done a very good job about just reminding folks that, hey, we got to follow a rule and regulation, and, and it's it's not personal. It's just something that we just have to deal with. Okay. Um, also, so the board, zoning board of adjustment inside of our code book is is governed by Chapter One Eighteen. Um, it starts. Um, where it gets specific about procedures and other things like that, it's 118-96, and it actually has a wealth of knowledge. Um, I won't go through each and every one of those sections, but if, uh, if you ever need to, to look at that, it talks about everything from a quorum. A quorum is um, where you have the proper amount of folks, like, like you are today, that you can actually have the, a, a, a legal meeting, and you have the appropriate people there. Um, also, it talks about how procedures and how to conduct the meeting, how long you serve is a two-year terms. I'm not sure if everyone knew that. Um, and then if there is the alternates and what their roles are. Um, where in Texas local government code this is over, um, or the Zoning Board of Adjustments talked about is in Chapter 211. Um, there they talk about very similar types of things and part of our ordinance actually adopts what the state says so we can be in line and that there isn't any uh, variation between the two. Um, this board only has five members. Uh, the council adopts uh, the procedures for this appointment and the alternates, well, we already talked about that. Um, we're gonna be uh, speaking about the compliance with Texas Open Meetings Act a little bit later with, uh, with Jerry. And then this, this board is governed by the Robert Rules of Order, the newly revised version, and, and that's where your authority of procedures and parliamentary law come into place. So when you make a motion, all of those things are kind of bound and directed through Robert Rules of Order. So as, as discussed before, there are some statutory requirements that are, that are called out, meaning from the state there's um, all meetings have to be uh, open to the public, which we do all the time. The board shall keep minutes. Um, that's something that um, Amy does for you at this particular time and making sure that uh, each, each vote for each person is, is done and you have a, a log of that. It's very important, um, especially if they're, if they're audited. The, the board shall keep records of its examinations and other official actions. So after you make an action, what happens behind the scenes is uh, Amy will fill in um, a certain template of letter, uh, the board uh, chairperson will sign it, and then, um, it's, um, and then recorded. And again, the minutes and the records uh, shall also be filed very similar to any other board uh, that you have here. So, um, Again, what you, and I know you know this, but just wanted to go through it all, is that you decide appeals from the decision of an administrative official during the zoning ordinance. Um, you may reverse, affirm, or modify any of those administrative officials' orders or requirements or decisions. Um, you also, also authorize variances and special exceptions. So what this board can do, so this is what you're, you're, you've been um, appointed to do is to interpret the zoning ordinance and how it applies and the facts uh, that, that it um, speaks of. You also can grant special exceptions when authorized by the ordinance. <coughs> you can grant a variance that will not be contrary to the public interest where due um, 
where due to special conditions, literal enforcement would result in unnecessary hardships, and so that the spirit of the ordinance is observed and substantial justice is done. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll find that people end up, they hear the word variance and they just will submit it thinking that it is just something that, well, it's just different than the ordinance, right? But these three things that I just spoke of are very important for you to ensure that uh, the variance, if approved, that it meets those rules and regulations. The Board of Adjustment is also an, basically an escape valve for the zoning ordinance when land does not fit ordinance, uh, a specific ordinance mold. <clears throat> what the Board cannot, or the Board of Adjustment cannot do, is grant a use variance, meaning that if a person were to come in here, like they do for a zoning board uh, or a zoning map amendment, um, they wouldn't be able to say, well, it's currently like retail or uh, like a donut shop, and then I want to put, um, you know, a pipe yard there, you know. And I know you guys know that, but some people believe that you can vary everything within the ordinance, and it, you cannot vary a use, okay? Uh, you can grant, you cannot grant an increase to the variant, another variance that was requested, or you won't be able to overturn a staff decision, authorize a variance from the zoning ordinance, or approve an applicant's request without less than 75% of the affirmative votes of the, of the members. And they refer to that as a super majority. Okay, just keep that right there. Yes, ma'am. I can't read what you, these little deals right here. Oh, no problem. I, I can give this to you afterwards if you'd like. Okay. <coughs> so some of the other things that are the dirt determinations of the board that can be heard, um, the board may hear issues on and make determinations for zoning agenda items like reconstruction of buildings occupied by non-conforming uses, provide such re recon reconstruction, um, does not prevent the eventual return of such property to a conforming use, excuse me, modifications of yard, open space, um, parking lot areas, lot size regulations, Uh, reduced uh, required off-street parking, um, appeals that are alleged in error uh, to the order, requirement, decision, and determination of the building official in the uh, uh, enforcement of this ordinance, um, authorized specific instances to, uh, to vary terms of zoning, uh, the zoning ordinance as variance is not contrary to the public interest of the city. So as you know, we the, the authority of the, uh, the BOA hears and decides uh, other matters authorized by ordinance adopted under the subchapter. Um, and again, if, if there is a, say if Planning and Zoning Commission were to deny um, or not recommend approval, the person still has the opportunity to move forward to City Council for approval. However, with that denial, that means that when they come before um, I'm sorry, I, I was messing those two up with uh, the BOA, so I apologize, I removed that one. I was stricken that from the from my presentation. Which one are you striking? Um, I was saying that it, it it's a 75% majority when uh, I was giving the wrong example. Um, I was thinking from planning and zoning to city council. But it still, it still lends itself to the same thing, is that if there is, um, if there is a, if, the, if staff recommends that there, it needs to be, it wasn't approved, it wasn't being recommended for approval, then there need to be a majority or a super majority of the, the, uh, the board to approve it, which means that it have to be four of the five members. Okay, this is a really important portion, um, and this is one of the things that I know the bo board chair and I talked about in the past, um, but this, the reason why this is important is that sometimes there isn't, um, or what I've noticed is that there wasn't a set of findings that was uh, presented at the time that either was approved or disapproved. So part of, and why this is important for you as a board is that if this were ever to be, um, your, your response were ever to be appealed to district court, they're gonna ask you, if, they, if it goes to court, they ask you to come in, they're gonna ask you what your findings were. And so this is really important for you to make sure that you understand this and as you are hearing what is presented to you, you're jotting things down, and so you're, you're able to 
um, in your um, in your vote, you're able to say the reason why you don't want to approve it, not just disapprove it or approve it by itself. So invariances, these are. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, if a, an example has been given, does that mean one of the means to say this is why it's not approved? It would be my recommendation, um, you know, and that's what I'm used to seeing. There are there are some people that don't do that. I know um, what we did in Boise Delta, but I. Um, well, did I answer your question? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and then these, in a variance, I think we're all aware that there is a hardship or, and it can't be self-inflicted. Um, and so these are unnecessary hardships. So what they are not is a property that cannot be for its, you can't use the hardship to say is that the property cannot be used for its highest and best use. You can't say that, well, it's a financial or economic hardship, so I need for you to approve this variance for me, or if it's self-created hardship or the development objectives of the property owner are, are because, um, or the owner or the property owner will be frustrated with the, the result because they're not getting what they want. Okay. Um, we've, uh, I'm sorry, we've already gone over this part, the findings or facts for necessarily grant variances, we already looked at that. So another findings of fact uh, or example would be extraordinary conditions. So these are um, that there are, is an extraordinary special condition affecting the land involved such that the strict, strict application of the provisions of this code will deprive the applicant of the reasonable use of their land. For example, a variance might be justified because of topographic or other special condition unique to the property, um, meaning that there might be some elevation changes and other things like that on the property and the development that is involved, well, might be justified due to the inconvenience or a final, or a financial disadvantage. So basically what would happen there is that a variance might be a, approved to increase density because this small area over here is only buildable on this larger piece of land that this other area is not, uh, it, it could not be built on. So that would be a reason why um, you could approve it or findings of a fact. Also, another one was the preservation of a substantial property right, that the variance is necessary for the preservation of the substantial property right of the applicant. Some other additional examples of findings of fact are substantial uh, detriment, that the granting of the variance will not be detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare, or injurious to the property in the area, or to the city in administering the code. Um, if there was other property that the conditions that create the need for the variance do not generally apply to these, to that property or, or the properties in the vicinity, or the applicant's actions, the plight of the owner of the property for which the variance is sought to do to unique circumstances existing on the property. Again, there just might be something that's special to the property that's causing the person to require the, the variance. And finally, the last findings of fact is that is it in is it in line with our um, with our guiding documents? One of those is our future land use plan that the granting of the variance would not substantially conflict with the future of the um, future land use plan or the purposes of the ordinance unless reasonable findings can be proven and acknowledged. <coughs> Utilization um, that because of these conditions that create the need for the variance, the application of the code to this particular piece of property would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization of the property. So if there were additional conditions that, that create this the need for the variance, um, then that would be, again, a substantial, or that would be um, a reasonable um, a reason for uh, approving the variance. <coughs> I know I wrote down that because I didn't know. Are we asking questions now or when you get through? Either way is fine. Okay. I know. Yes, ma'am. Well, it is a land use plan. We're, I think she's just saying in line with our land use plan, we have this zoning plan, which is in the, sure. the map. So you the, can see that, but what is... So the, the, the future land use plan is a component of the comprehensive plan. So currently, right now, you have a comprehensive plan that has multiple chapters. 
in, in that comprehensive plan, there is one of the chapters that is called Future Land Use Plan. So this is... Um, is this, this is the comprehensive plan that's like how many years old? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this isn't, I mean, nothing was decided. We don't we have do not have a new one as of right now. Okay. So we are still using that old one. It's still okay. it's still in play. Okay. And that's what Mr. New is going to be working on, as he said to you, is that something they're looking to um, amend that plan. Okay. This was just a reiteration of another slide that we, we had. I apologize. So variance versus special exception. Um, this is something that you, in the time that I've been here, there hasn't been a, a distinction between the two and there's been, well, in actuality, there's been very little um, special exceptions that have been requested. Um, the only ones that I could find in our, or probably within the last five years were fence related ones, which were um, if a fence could be a certain height or not. So the difference between a variance and a special exception <coughs> is that um, you don't need to display a hardship for a special exception. Um, it's a little bit different actually. The reason for it is that it, it just allows for certain things that can be done um, within the city. It, it, it removes a little bit of the red tape for items that the city has acknowledged. For example, it could be for some vegetation, it could be for fencing, it could be for, um, I'm trying to think of another example, but we currently don't, we currently don't have that within our ordinance, but we're looking to um, do some amendments and some text amendments to add that in there. So we don't have that right now? We, the only thing that we've been using it for um, as of late within the fa last five years is a special exception for um, height of fences. Okay, and we did not hear that? Or are you saying that the city had, dis the staff had decided that that was a special exception? No, no, you, you've heard it. You've okay, heard it. I know that, we've heard fences, right. but no one's presented so that, it as the, a special that's exception. That's kind of, that's the, uh, the, the, the difference between the two is that in a variance versus a special exception, you don't need to um, show a hardship in, in the special exception. Okay. So you still have to go through and you still have to answer all the questions that are requested of you. Um, but it is a li little bit more lenient than it, it, it is for a variance. Okay. So rules and procedures, as you can see in your, um, your handout or your packet or your black folders, you'll have a copy of this Zoning Board of Adjustment Rules and Procedures. Um, again, another wealth of knowledge. Um, it kind of walks through some of the very straightforward points of uh, what's going on um, as or what, what, is, what are your rules and procedures that you must follow as a board member? One of the things that uh, it is talked about in there is that who may appeal a decision to the board. And so we, we are going to be uh, presenting some additional text uh, to make sure that this, because this currently within our ordinance is a little bit confusing. Okay, so can you go to that slide that you're on? Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but basically what, what we would like to change it to is be in line with the local government code, with the Texas local government code. Um, so we just want to make sure that all of these, these sync together so we're, we're on the same page when it comes down to that. So who may appeal a decision? Is a person aggrieved by the administrative official's decision? Uh, and again, aggrieved means interested, affected, or aggrieved in such a way that is different than a member of the general public. And any officer deport, uh, department, board, or bureau of municipality affected by the administrative official's decision. So how are you, uh, what change are you recommending to that? Well, it, we'll be bringing it before, um, and we're going to be bringing it up at that, uh, that committee meeting. Um, but there's going to be some word, some, some verbiage change to ensure that it kind of dictates what exactly what it states in the in the local government code currently it doesn't say that. so as of right now this is what we're bound by correct yes you're bound by what what the local government code says that's correct but but also where it says who may appeal a decision from the board yes ma'am well i thought you said um no one could appeal, appeal the decision but it would have to go to the board 
No, no, no. Uh, so, so there, there is the appeal. Th well, that's right. That's right. You're, you're, you're correct. Is that? Um, to the city planner. Yes. So if the city planner says something, right? We, we, if they make a decision. Okay, your first everything. slide. Can you go back to where you have who may appeal a decision to the board? Okay, that is discussed. The, the who may appeal a decision to us are the ones that we get when someone comes to planning and zoning. I mean, when they come to the office, fill out the paperwork, and they want to appeal this decision to us, correct? That's appealing it to we us. Appeal to the decision. Yes, yes. Okay. Then the next slide is who may appeal a decision from the board. That's if the person doesn't agree with our ruling, That's they correct. then have the right to appeal that to district court. That's correct. Okay. Does that answer it for you, Sally Ann? Okay. Because it doesn't go to commissioners here. It goes to district court from here. Yeah. I know. I think he was misspoke on that. Did I say the commissioner's court? Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, I'm yeah. sorry. But yeah, Early. it goes to, it goes to district yeah. court. Yes. Sorry. Go back to the slide, though, where it says who may appeal a decision to. Yes, go ahead. Is this the one? No. no. Oh, I'm sorry. Before sorry. that. <coughs> that one. Okay. And I think we need to talk about this because this is what this workshop's for, is for us to get a better guidance on what we can hear. Because as we all know, at the last meeting, we were told that we didn't have standing to hear that last, that, that appeal, the one with the triangular shaped lot. Okay, I'm, try, I'm trying to bring myself back to why we chose the board. Um, we were told that we didn't have standing because we only could hear, I think Mr. Baker told us that we, we didn't have standing because it wasn't a... Um, it had to do with subdivisions, oh, but yet, yes, I'm sorry. But yes. yet, every subdivision has zoning. Well, right. And so also there's there's a so the difference is is that there is a chapter, and I think here it's chapter forty six. I might be getting that wrong, but there's a, there's a zoning code which is chapter one eighteen, mm -hmm. and then there's a subdivision code, right? Mm -hmm. So when the what was being requested at, the, at that last meeting? Well, there was a lot of different things that were happening. Right? Mm -hmm. But the one thing that we were talking about that you didn't have standing as this board because <laughs> it was derived from that chapter of the subdivision ordinance. Okay, but and that's still not spelled out in our rules that we don't hear subdivisions. And the city ordinance sure. section 118.100A clearly says um, any decision of the city planning. Yes. And any decision of the city planner. So this, these are the areas that Mr. Baker and I have noticed that there was, uh, I understand what the intent was, but th that is incorrect. So well, we, we, you can't say that's incorrect. This was the city government decided this, city council decided this when this was done. Sure. You can't, as a planner, decide the city council is wrong. But, okay. So what I would recommend then it's what I recommend is this. I'm going to ask the chair to draft a letter to the attorney general's office to ask the attorney general's office if this language is in line with proper state law. And if it is, it stays. And we have that authority. If it is not, then we do not. But Mr. Baker, nor the interim city planner, can make that decision. And neither, and, and by, by the way, right. neither can this board make that decision. So the reason why I say that, too, and, and by all means, I mean, okay. that's what We're all just getting, we're, we're, yeah, okay. as you know, we're a small community. We get sure. lots of feedback from people saying yeah, different course. things. I, I and then when I, personally. It's okay. I know. And then when I read this, and I read it before, mm -hmm. it doesn't say that we can, that we only hear things. It says, or ordinance pertaining to zoning. And when they said, but, but, and, and as we all know, every subdivision has a zone, it has zoning within mm -hmm. the city limits. So I guess I'm just looking at what the law was, are there guides, the rules were in place on that day, or as of right now, if someone decided this right now, I just, I'm, I'm glad that Mrs. Forbes and I have not, I've met her for the first time 
at, the, at that last meeting and then she had to leave and we'll talk, get into that in a minute. Sure. And when she emailed this, uh, this that she wanted to put on the agenda, I mean, I am in agreement with that. Do we need like an outside counsel to, to advise us as to what we can hear and what we can't hear? And that's completely up to you. I mean, okay. you can do that. And again, uh, I think we're going to be talking about that in a little bit about, okay. you know, part of what one of Mrs. Forbes' questions was to, to discuss is that, is there a budget for this or is there, right? right? So uh, I believe that Jerry's going to be talking about that when he comes up here. So we can talk about that. And I just wanted to comment very quickly. Uh -huh. The difference between the subdivision ordinance and the zoning ordinance, mm -hmm. and whether it says it or not, sir, and, and, and that's completely no, I fine. The yeah. difference, so you really don't have to explain the difference between the two. I understand it. But I also understand what is clearly written in the ordinance. Sure. And, the, and uh, uh, 11899 clearly says that this body will also hear uh, um, this chapter, yes, but there's an and, city rules and regulations. I understand. And I, and I understand the, the way that it's written, how it could sound, right? Well, I it's think not that just how it sounds, that's, the ha that's how it is. Uh, and uh, well, in the last you, you Let me finish for just one second. I was just going to say is that the difference what we had talked about with Mr. Baker before, and again, you know, I, I could be wrong, no, no, no worries. It's just that this is the Zoning Board of Adjustment, right? Mm -hmm. And then if there was... If there was the same direction for aggrieved or appeals in the subdivision ordinance, it would tell us, I would think it would tell us that this is the way, this is the path for you to take your um, appeals in the subdivision ordinance. And currently right now, and this is what we were doing, we were researching both of them to say, mm -hmm. there is no appeals process currently in our subdivision ordinance. And if you go to 211 of the local government code, it specifically states in here that this board shall only hear zoning-related items. And those those are the exact words. That's in that where? That's the state. But that's the state, that's correct? That's the state. Let me show you. Yes. But it also refers Nathan, to... Nathan, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I dropped off because of some pro technical problem, but I called in by phone, so... Can I ask a question about uh, the subdivision and the, its relation to, to zoning? Sure. Um, I know when I was on planning and zoning that we frequently heard planned developments, which is basically a subdivision. And my understanding was that, um, you know, that's under the purview of planning and zoning uh, commission to review those and approve or disapprove them or modify them and that um, the type of decision that was made in the previous appeal um, had to do with the fact that it was less than four or five subdivision units. So that could be done administratively. So I'm not, it doesn't really make sense to me why an item like that would be under the purview of the Planning and Zoning Commission, but yet the administrative portion of the same basic activity would not be under the purview of the Zoning Board of Adjustments because who's going to review those decisions if it's not us? There, there, there's an appeal process, so if it's not us reviewing it. Well, I'm not sure if I completely understand your question, but I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to respond. Is that what I'm hearing you say is that a subdivision, right, where a planned development in, and people call things subdivisions. I think the difference in the in the definition that is given in a subdivision ordinance and a zoning ordinance is zoning is specifically for land use and subdivision is actually the separation or assembly of property. So when you subdivide something, it could be subdividing from a larger tract to two smaller tracts or three smaller tracts or assembling property from one or two to something very large. So those are distinctly, and they're looked at differently from the, the state and in, in, in our ordinance here. So I'm, I'm not sure if I really completely understand your question, Maggie. I'm, um, Can I try it again? Yes, please. <laughs> so my question is, why does the Planning and Zoning Commission review subdivisions greater than five, but there's no board 
you're arguing that ZBA or, or there is no board for an, a, an appeal process for subdivisions less than anything that subdivisions less than four or five. Um, I mean, there's, if, if we're, okay, I'm, and again, I'm struggling here because I think you're referring to the difference between a five acre tract, uh, five acres or less, is that it, it would need to be um, heard by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Anything more than um, doesn't have to be. Now, there is a whole myriad of different rules and regulations that go along with it. It tells you if you, you don't have to subdivide if you're selling a piece of property, if it's over 10 acres, because, um, I mean, that's one of the rules or exceptions to it. However, if you decide to subdivide it, you still have to. So there is a lot of what ifs that go along with that. I don't think I can give you a straight answer right off the bat. I'd like to sit down with you further if I could, um, just so ma uh, make sure that I answer your question. I don't, I've never been on planning. She's talking about planning and zoning, P yes, and Z. Okay. Yeah. I I've well, not I understand been on that. P and Z. Is yeah. Maggie, is, aren't you saying that if P and Z has the authority to hear a subdivision, why don't we have the authority to hear the appeal? Yeah, because obviously it's considered a planning and zoning item. It's not considered separately. And there are regulations addressing subdividing within the planning and zoning section of the city ordinances, if I'm not mistaken. When you say planning and zoning, are you speaking of the subdivision ordinance or for the zoning ordinance? I, I think. Um, well, I just know it's in that section called, it's in section 118. So sec okay, in so you're saying zoning it reflects or do you have the specific location? No, unfortunately I don't. But there, uh, well, there is sorry. a procedure before Los Angeles that's called the administrative process. Right, and that would be called out in the so subdivision that, ordinance. That would be four or less. Yes, sir. Or greater would be planning and zoning. So there is a procedure in place for that. Because I know we heard one of Ed's that was less than four. Yeah. Yeah, but because mine was 99 feet, not right. Yeah. Okay, but, but it was, but it was only three lots, wasn't it? Yeah, but it, yeah. Yeah. it was a depth. So I was just gonna say there is an appeal process under state law for subdivisions, and it involves city council and state court. Is that that's according to the Texas local, go government, code. local government code? But what does the if, the local government code is what would govern if you did not have this right here, correct? Local government code is what controls the zoning. Okay, but then you can overlay on top of that. You can make if it more stringent. More stringent. More stringent. More stringent. Okay. Okay. You can make it more, but you can't make it less? Yes. Okay. So this actually then is on top of the local government code, mm -hmm. correct? This is on top of the local government code. This right here. But these are our city ordinances. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, you were just, you were referring to local government code. Correct. As if that was well, the only I, thing I, we could I was go by. About the subdivision or, ordinances. Or uh huh. Um, I was just saying that there is an appeal process within the local government code for subdivision appeals. Okay. It, and it depends on. But the there's not avenue. one. There's not one in this presently. In our codes, in she's our asking that in our ordinances. ordinances. Uh -huh. I think you can appeal to the, the court. Right, but we don't have one. You can appeal to the court. Yes. You can appeal to, but you can't, it, is that, does it say that in here? You have to appeal to the court, not the ZBA? Or to? There's no mention of the ZBA in the subdivision ordinance. I think so what the she, assess, the assess, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think what she was asking in this, uh, is there anything about subdivisions? Well, I, th I believe Maggie's saying that there is, and I'm asking her what that reference is. I, d I don't, I would say that those are two distinct, one's a chapter for zoning and one is a chapter for um, subdivision. However, the way that it's written in zoning, it leads you to believe that because it has, it doesn't specify that this is just zoning, although it's written in the zoning code, it states that you can, um, the Zoning Board of Adjustment can hear anything. And my contention is that, that whether it is agreed upon or not, that if you read the uh, chapter 211, and again, I'm not an attorney. Mm -hmm. I've just done this for a while. 
is that Chapter 211 specifically states that the Board of Adjustment, unless given other rules and regulations. So the Board of Adjustment actually technically, if you go to the Aviation Code of the City of Nacogdoches, the Board of Adjustments actually their appeals procedure, or their, their, if something goes wrong in the aviation portion, you guys hear it. Mm -hmm. When it comes to zoning. Okay. So, so if, which if I think goes back to the case, as I said earlier, I believe we need a decision from an outside legal controlling authority. And the most reasonable one that I know would be the Attorney General's mm -hmm. office. And we need to know, is this phrase, and actually there's two different places, because in the ordinance uh, 11899, it says this chapter and, and city rules and regulations. And then in uh, 18100, it says any decision of the city planner. I have to admit that that's, I don't know how you can, how you can say, uh, as Larry just said, that any decision of the city planner doesn't mean, it, you're, it's like you're trying to argue that it's, it really says any decision unless it has to do with subdivisions. Well, really the argument is any decision so that, that you know, deals with zoning. <laughs> The argument that's being made is any decision that deals with zoning, but it doesn't say that. Interesting. Right, it doesn't. And backing that up is earlier in uh, 11899, it says this chapter, which is referring to zoning, and city rules and regulations, which would be any city rule and regulation. They don't limit it. Jackie. If you go back to the purpose of zoning and comprehensive plan, you talk about uh, protecting the public health, safety, and welfare, natural resources, community character, and aesthetics. We have subdivisions here too, and if we have no say in that, how are we going to protect, uh, carry out the purpose of what we're here for if we cannot, we don't have anything to do with subdivisions? And subdivisions so are here. I, honestly, I believe that the deal is um, the definition, right? So the definition of subdivision in our in our ordinance is the, the either the assembly or the, um, um, subdiv the subdivision of property, right? When we say subdivision, like you're saying right now, I believe that you're referring to a neighborhood that's being built just over over the hill or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And well, so an existing or new subdivision. Existing or new <laughs> subdivision, right? So the wording that is being used in our ordinance, the word subdivide, is for the subdivision or assembly of land. So then on top of that, we have zoning, which dictates land use, right? Mm -hmm. So there's two different, there's two different um, codes that we're speaking. And so I know what they're saying about subdivision, but they were... In that particular context, they're actually talking about um, the subdivision of, or the subdivision that has housing and whatnot, so not not the other chapter. Right, but is even a subdivision has to subside? Is it R one, R two, or whatever? Is it not zoned something, or is it mm -hmm. just? Yes, it is. Yeah, if it's inside the city limits, it would be zoned, so whatever it might be. So, but I mean, it's also a, that be something that the this board can if it's zoned. If it's zoned, yeah, the board can. I think, uh, and I will say, I know we're we're where were you in your presentation? Because I think what we're realizing, and it sounds like Miss Swearing is on the same page that that I am as well, is I think we're. I, I would be interested now that when I said I'm not so sure we don't need outside counsel to tell us I have nothing I don't I don't have a problem with Mr. Baker it's just that he is representing the city of Nacogdoches we're charged with representing 
the citizens of Nacogdoches, and the, as Jacqueline said, their welfare and safety and their the public trust, I guess, is what I'm looking at. But, so okay, and but but I just want to make sure that I understand. Is that are you believing that this board shall review all the city codes and and be that place where any appeal that comes? To, from no, I think we need board? guidance on okay. what we need guidance, and I I'm, I'm I've, I will say I've kind of lost faith because we're we're being told one thing of what you would like for it to be, and I understand where you would like for it to be, but where we're at is where we're at. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, and, and again... I, and I understand it may be clearer if we get to where you're talking about, but right now, nobody has made that decision. It hadn't been voted on by city council or the citizens or, sure. or anything. I, and I, if I could make a recommendation then, um, you know, we, and Jerry's going to talk about this, or Michael may talk about this, we have... The city has a subscription, uh, maybe that's a poor, a poor um, description, but there's the Texas, the Texas Municipal League mm -hmm. provides us with legal counsel, mm -hmm. and it's something that is separate from this, or from the city, and you could request that, you know, ask your questions directly to them, and it's something that we already um, use here at the city of Nacogdoches. Okay. And you could, sure. Yeah, and I just want to say is that some of this stuff that we ended up finding, mm -hmm. you know, it, it wasn't, we just found it because we, we, or myself especially, as I came from different jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and I know what, what happened there, and when seeing that wor or those that wording, it's not, again, not telling anybody that they're doing anything wrong, mm -hmm. I just think that it was misrepresented, that's all. Well, well and at this point, we don't know. Yes, sir. We don't know what the motivation was in sure. writing it. We don't know what the council intended sure. when they wrote it. Uh, and I know you can't catch everything. I mean, in documents like this, yes, there's sir. going to be things that come up. But when they do, we have to correct them. And or, and I think that's what, but we're just looking at where we're at right now. Because right now, this is what we're bound by, correct? That That is correct. This zoning. Yes, sir. Right here. Okay. Yeah. Jacqueline. One, one last thing. Even if you're like talking about a big subdivision or let's say if I wanted to subdivide my yard and do something, you s still you go back to the mission of this board, the safety, welfare, and, and the uh, perseverance of, like, the, of Nacogdoches. We still have to take all of that in, into consideration no matter what the definition of subdivision is. And if it has to do with zoning and we're the zoning board, it seems like, um, you know, the higher, would you want the higher court to decide what goes on here, or would you want to give us or Nacogdoches a chance to decide that versus a oh, court? Oh, of course. Somewhere? I mean, yeah, and I think we're using one example, that mm -hmm. one that confu that has mm -hmm. obviously confused m m me also, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, again, I'm just giving you my um, my experience and in, in working with the subdivision and the zoning code from different cities, and there were different, the board that, that heard it, the Board of Adjustment, only heard zoning related items. And, and that's, that's, that's my reality. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that I don't, I just think that if, if you're not, if, if you wanna hear it from somebody else, then I think that's a, I think that, I think, I I think that's, I, that's I don't know the about the rest go. of the board. Are y'all wanting to get a little bit better guidance on where we're at? What does what would be I mean I don't what would be like the budget for this if we wanted to get outside counsel to just advise us that that would not be for me to say um, okay you know I, I wouldn't have a, a say in that but from my understanding there there is no a budget per se okay. um, but it might go uh, from the general fund I don't know so well, we'd have to go to the city council yeah and then have to agree to okay to I don't uh, yeah I don't know the channels on that. So to ask, like you said, to, to write a letter to the DA, to ask them to... to we wouldn't need to do that. Um, it it would be either the attorney, attorney general or we could just get outside counsel. But if we went to the attorney general, would that cost anything? Or is that part of what the attorney general does? That's his office handles those things. Okay. But uh, I think Ron was saying if we had outside counsel, maybe we could 
I'll have to go to the attorney general. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm looking at just. Uh, uh, would you guys be able to turn your mics on? Just so. Okay. Oh, mine's on. Okay. Oh, mine's not. Okay. David and I are sharing. We're sharing now. That's no problem at all. Our okay. Just make sure you're um, you. All right. Where were we on this? So we can. Uh, but I think we've um, kind of decided right that, to, that. That's okay. okay. Yeah. I mean. Because with this, like I said, I wanted to call this as a workshop because I knew we weren't going to be voting on anything, but we all just needed to be, we can't talk to each other because we have to do the Open Meetings Act. So I thought this would be the best way to do it so that we sure. could all talk and visit without any repercussions and also following the law. So, sure. Okay. Okay. And I'm, I'm just going to skip okay. right to the end is on okay. practical tips is that just for, for all of you guys to... Um, just be cautious and, and don't speed up the process. You know, let, let the process um, happen and treat all applicants similarly. Um, make sure you, you have proper findings. That, that was one thing that I wanted to make sure that's clear. Um, that will make your whole lot, your life a whole lot easier if, if this, yeah. Out of the 20 years I've been doing this, I've only seen two that have ever gone to appeals uh, to, or to the uh, district court. District court. So, but again, if you have your if you do your homework and you have things in front of you, um, you won't have any issues. Make sure you frame your comments in objective terms. Be attentive. Um, a lot of folks that come before you, you know, there's usually money at, at hand. So just as a reminder for that, avoid personal attacks. Um, and when in doubt, ask your attorney. But we're here to a answer any other questions. I know okay. that one specifically, whether you as a board hear everything right. or not, that's fine, but you still might have other questions when it comes down to overall what your what your roles are. Uh, it just happens to be that you know there is an opportunity for someone that could come up and um, serve you papers, um, but that could be anything right. And I think that's on, on our agenda in a minute. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So were you you were item A? Or are you were you also item B on workshop? And your B, okay, so we're moving to C, presentation and discussion regarding conflict of interest provisions. And uh, thank we, you, Mr. Dietrich. Yeah, of course. Okay. Um, we did uh, offer a break there. I'm not sure if anyone needs a break, but... Can I ask a question? Yeah. We need to take a break. Do what? If we need to take a break, but I think that was in the agenda this time. Uh... I don't need or one. She's Jacqueline's fine. Are y'all okay to continue on? Okay. It's it. Well, he had an appointment at five. For a point of information, could I ask? Them? Okay. Yes. Um, has everyone on this board finished their open meetings training? I did. I've had it. I've had it. Okay. I, I, I wonder why it's in the new training again on open meetings. Well, we might skip that one if we're just going to do the, because is that what, the, were you just going to do the training on open meetings? It's just an overview. Okay. I think we've all, what, what, let's go on to number C, the presentation discarding, uh, and discussion regarding conflict of interest provisions. Okay. Um, Jerry Baker, uh, City Attorney, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for inviting us here to, uh, this evening to uh, go over these matters. Uh, as uh, it was mentioned, this uh, discussion is over the conflicts of interest. Particularly, we're focusing on Texas Local Government Code 17101 and the, the ones that follow this. This is going to be the provision from the Local Government Code. When it comes to conflicts of interest, it's going to apply to most people. Okay, there are others that I'll mention, but this is the one that's really uh, relevant to most of us. Uh, so the general rule is it prohibits a local public official from voting on or participating in a matter involving a business entity or real property in which the official has a substantial interest. And don't worry, I'll break that down here as we go through, but this is what the general rule is from uh, Chapter 171. So what is a local public official? Um, it is defined at, in the statute as a member of the governing body or another officer, whether elected, appointed, paid or unpaid, of any municipality or other local government entity who exercises responsibilities beyond those that are advisory in nature. So 
for, that would mean that it would apply to this board in particular. You are a local public official. Each one of you apply for that uh, or meet that definition. Uh, even though you are appointed, not elected, and are unpaid, uh, you serve uh, and exercise responsibilities beyond something that is just advisory in nature. So um, just to kind of explain that a bit, and I'll, I'll be brief on this, we, have, we do have some boards that you may be familiar with that can call themselves advisory committees, Main Street Advisory Committee is the, the example I've cited here. Um, and the, the AG has issued an opinion um, as to what constitutes advisory committee, and it doesn't necessarily mean that if you put that in your title that you get to uh, avoid being subject to 171. Uh, the AG has said that if the government body that has established the advisory committee, for example, a city council, routinely adopts or rubber stamps the advisory committee's recommendations, the committee probably will be considered a governmental body subject to the act. So like historical board? If they're making decisions um, that, you know, it, that even if it's a recommendation of some type and it goes to the city council or another board or whatever above them and they just r routinely put it on the consent agenda, or don't really discuss it at that point, then that advisory board can be considered a governmental body uh, by, the, by the Attorney General. So that doesn't really apply to you guys because you're a governmental body uh, that are <laughs> subject to 171, but I just wanted to kind of point that out. Just because the name says advisory, just be cautious if you're serving on other boards. Here's some excerpts from your uh, boards and commissions handbook. A board or commission member is considered a public servant, a local public official, which we just cited from 171, and a city officer. Board members are responsible for knowing and adhering to the ethical standards set forth by the city of Nacogdoches. So if you serve on a board or commission for the city of Nacogdoches, you fall under this definition. All board members are expected to complete required training, adhere to high ethical standards, and avoid all conflicts of interest. Board members shall not use their office for private advance advancement or gain or to secure special privileges or exemptions for themselves or others. And uh, finally, Chapter 171 of the Local Government Code requires a board member with a conflict of interest to file an affidavit with the city and abstain from voting on the matter before the board. The board member should not, not be involved in presenting the matter in which he or she has conflict of interest to the board and many instances should not be present. I want to emphasize that last part here, and we'll get to it in just a minute, but just put a pin in that because I'll come back to it. So what is a substantial interest? What does that mean? Um, and I, use, I look at the term substantial, and I think, you know, probably a significant amount, right? Well, here's what the state law says. If you own 10% or more of the voting stock or shares in the business entity, you have a substantial interest. That's not very much. If you own 10% or more or $15,000 or more of the fair market value of the business entity, you have a substantial interest. If you receive fund from the business entity that exceeds 10% of the person's gross income for the preceding year, you have a substantial interest in that business entity. Okay? So as you can see, these amounts are not that great. Let me get my water. Um, so just, I just want you to exercise caution. If anything comes before this board that involves a business entity that you may fall into one of those categories, um, you'll need to go through the process that we'll go through here in a minute. And if you have a, you can have a substantial interest in real property if the interest is an equitable or legal ownership interest with a fair market value of $2,500 or more. That's not very much, is it? And it's, it's equitable or legal, legal ownership interest. So you could be a beneficiary uh, or something in, of that nature and still be subject to that. So again, exercise caution if any, any property comes before this board that you may have uh, uh, a substantial interest as they define it under the, under the statute, we'll go through that process. Um, exercise caution every time. A local public official is also considered to have a substantial interest in a business entity or real property if a close relative has a substantial interest in the business entity of real property. What's a close relative? It's one within a first degree of consanguinity, that means blood or affinity, marriage. So it could be a spouse, parent, child, stepchild, father, mother-in-law, son, or daughter-in-law. If they, any one of those people 
have a substantial interest as it is defined in one of this, whether it's real property or a business entity, you have to identify that and not participate in any uh, uh, actions related to those things. So what are your requirements? If you have a conflict of interest or if you have a, and that means if you're, you know, a close relative has a conflict of interest, you have to file an affidavit. You file that with the local unit's official record keeper, which in this instance is the city secretary. Notice here that that affidavit must be filed before a vote takes place or a decision on the matter is made. Okay? So if you see something that comes up on an agenda that potentially it would involve either a real, you know, a property interest or a business entity that you have a substantial interest in, be sure and get that affidavit filed before uh, that meeting takes place. Okay? Secondly, you need to abstain from any discussion in the item and abstain from voting on the item. Now, the rules don't specify that you have to be absent or remove yourself from the um, location. So if you're in a meeting like this, uh, the rules don't require you to actually remove yourself from the meeting. I, I would, as the, uh, the, uh, the handbook references and recommends, that would be my recommendation as well, that you completely remove yourself from the meeting altogether if you filed the affidavit. And uh, that makes it clear. And I would have it recorded on the, on the record um, and make sure that you, you, you have left the meeting. And as soon as that discussion happens, you can come back and, uh, and the vote is taking place. Then you can come back to the meeting and participate. But just, I think, out of abundance of caution, remove yourself from the meeting um, so there's no question. Um, you know, your very presence can influence, you know, somebody's vote. So just keep that in mind. So violations for a conflict of interest laws. Any action taken in violation of conflict of interest laws is voidable. I mean, it's not necessarily void, but it's voidable and may be reversed by a court. So if there's a, a variance granted or, or something of that nature that comes before you, that can potentially be reversed or, or voided by the court. How so? It can be voided if uh, you're, uh, it would not have passed without the vote of the official who violated the conflict of interest law, i.e. the deciding vote. Okay. However, there are criminal penalties as well. It's not just the, the potential of that action being overturned, but there are criminal penalties that you need to be aware of. A knowing violation of Chapter 171 is a Class A misdemeanor, which is punishable with a fine of $4,000 or incarceration of up to a year. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a couple other uh, statutes that apply to conflicts of interest. Chapter 176 really deals with vendors who conduct business or are conducting business with a local governmental entity. Probably not going to come into effect here with the ZBA. You're not really going to deal with many vendors here. Uh, you're not buying services or anything of that nature. But if it does arise, there are two forms that have to be completed, one by the local government officer, which is you, and one by the vendor. And those are available on the state's website, the Texas Ethics Commission. Those forms, are you can download those or print them out. If We've got them in the office, too. So if you, if you need to get those... Um, uh, questionnaires and, and statements, we can get those to you. <clears throat> and finally, Chapter 553 of the Texas Government Code, a public servant who has a legal or equitable interest in property that is going to be acquired public funds shall file an affidavit within 10 days before the date in which the property is to be acquired or purchased or condemnation. So um, this um, is probably not something that's going to affect most people. It's just a, if there's going to be an acquisition of property, either by and it, it, public funds, so it could be by the city, by the county, whatever. You just need to make sure that that affidavit is filed 10 days before the acquisition date. And, it, and instead of filing it with the city secretary, by law, it has to be filed with the county clerk at the county courthouse. Okay? So it's a little bit different than your uh, regular uh, conflict of interest affidavit. Any questions? Uh, I don't think so. Does it, I don't have any. Does anybody have any? Okay. 
Um, and I think we're just going to not do the, the item D. We are, we've all taken the Open Meetings Act online, and I know I've taken it many times. <laughs> we, I mean, I think some of these, everybody on the board I've seen before on, at other, on other boards, so I think they've taken it as well. Mm -hmm. Maggie, are you still there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Do you want me to, I'm going to go ahead and read what you asked for us to discuss uh, on, on, on on the agenda, is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, our item E, the board for the workshop, is to discuss board members' responsibilities and lawsuits, specifically served lawsuits as board members, and the timing and impacts on the meeting outcome. Additionally, discuss how to handle such actions in the future. Um, Johnny and uh, Sally Ann, I don't know if you were aware, but two of our board members were served with lawsuits just before our previous meeting. And of course, it, we were rather discombobulated with it because there was a lot of people here and nobody really knew what to do. Um, so I guess we're just saying we, we need to know if, that, if they even had to recuse themselves. I don't know that they had to, but they just thought so. But I wanna ask council or the staff how would you handle that if we were, if it was the city council? Would someone really be able to approach? The, I guess I had the problem that they even had the ability to approach the, this area and serve someone with a lawsuit. And then when you realize, after I was thinking about it later, because I was a legal assistant before this <laughs> lifetime, um, is that they, they weren't served by a process server or a law enforcement officer, so really, there was no validity to it, they just handed it to them, but it's it's disconcerting when you're setting up here and then you're handed with a lawsuit. So um, I guess what I'm asking can, can is- Can I add? Okay. Can I add that the plaintiff of the lawsuit um, had, a, had an interest in the item that was being heard that day yeah. for appeals and he, he targeted Mr. King and I because Mr. King made the motion to hear the appeal and I seconded it. And the charges were completely unfounded, but um, I regret that I left the meeting. However, I didn't have time because of the timing of it to even read the papers. So I just wanted to add that it was, I don't know that it affected the outcome, but it potentially did. And I think we need to put something in place, whether it's a delay you know, maybe an automatic postponement of hearing that item. I don't know what the answer is, but but government can't function if this is allowed to happen. That was disruptive. Thank you, I'm done. It was disruptive to the meeting, it, clearly. It looked which, really bad which or is sinister. A, which in and of itself is a violation of, of state law for, to disrupt a private meeting. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I... When I was given the papers and, and they were not served properly, um, but I didn't recognize that fact until after I left the meeting and consulted with my attorney, my personal attorney. Right. Well, we were all rather discombobulated. I mean, I think everybody can agree with that. Nobody really knew what, what to, I mean, we were all just sort of scrambling because in hindsight, I look at it as the chair. I'm not so sure that I shouldn't have just said, gaveled in the meeting and just said, look, we you know, we've had this happen, we need to recess and see what we're, you know, what we're doing here, or we need to postpone this hearing well, till we could further investigate why these two were targeted, because I, none of the rest of us received a lawsuit. Uh, but One of the more concerning things is now that this has been done, it may be done again and again and again and yes. again. Yes. So we need to take steps with the staff of the city to make sure that these meetings are not disrupted. That means, if it means that we have a police officer here, we need to have a police officer here. Uh, they, the, uh, the plaintiff, the people that are, are, are involved in the case do not need to approach um, any of us. I agree. Uh, they don't need to come up here. I mean, it was paper he gave me, but he could have given me something else. Exactly. And could have done something else. Uh, Mr. Baker, do y'all have any kind of direction for city council on issues like that? As far as being served with papers? Right. 
are, are people approaching them? Because I know they sit in the same place that we do. There, there's an officer here for city we have, council. We, have, we do have an officer present at city council meeting. Okay. Um, I wasn't aware of that. Um, I just think that we've got to, we need to decide something because that it would, the thing is that person that served the papers was the applicant in that. He was the applicant. That's correct. Yes, yes he was. Subject to the applicant. Well, he was the one that had, that was the he property was, in question. He was not the applicant. He yes. was the property owner. He right? was the property owner. He had an interest in the hearing. Okay. Okay, he had an, it, to me, s someone that had the, an interest in the hearing and then serves, files a lawsuit, then to me they are trying to manipulate the outcome of that hearing. Because, oh, yeah. exactly. intimidate. It's hostile. Yes. And I, I felt, you know, as a new person coming in, my intent was to come here and, and observe and to look and see what goes on, but I mean, it, it was very hostile, I think, to you know, just pluck them off like that. Um. If that happened with the city, uh, with any of the city council, what would your recommendation be? Same thing as hers. Yes. I would look at the papers and see if there was anything that would pre prevent the city council member from serving at that meeting. Okay. And would that's you? what I spoke to Mr. King about before the meeting. I said, there, there's nothing in here that precludes you from serving in this meeting. That, that is correct. He did say that. But um, my lawyer and my lawyer's partner, when they got the papers the next day, within a few seconds looked at them and said, this is nonsense. Uh, my lawyer that night said, well, it was not served properly because... Uh, it wasn't a process server. Or any, I mean, I, I thought about that later because, mm -hmm. I, as I, as you know, I walked in as they were kind of walking out. I had just met Maggie, and then she left. Well, I, but so, even let's assume that they had a process server that came, uh -huh. came and served you. Unless there's a TRO or a, an order from right. a court precluding you from serving at that mm -hmm. meeting, you can right. continue with but that meeting. But don't you agree that it had its desired effect? Um, from his perspective, yes. Okay, <laughs> I think that's what I'm saying is that I and don't that's think what that we need to prevent. Yes, and and I mean in a courtroom because I think we all agree that this is a semi-judicial body. In a courtroom, you have a bailiff, and if if a person tries to approach the judge in a courtroom, what's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to be removed, probably. Exactly. And so. We need the same sort of structure here because, unfortunately, there are people that are angry. There are people that are upset. And it's not like a city council meeting. Uh, sometimes people get upset at a city council meeting. But by and large, they're not dealing with uh, financial interests most of the time or um, their home or some property that they own most of the time in a city council meeting. But... We need, some, we need some structure here to provide for that not happening again, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. I don't think we can, uh, I don't think we can guarantee anything not happening again, no, but we need, plan, we need a procedure in place. Mm -hmm. can, can I just add that it's not just about whether or not we had to recuse ourselves. It's about what it does to your thinking process when you're up there and the meeting is like, 15 seconds away from starting and you don't even have time to look at the paperwork. I mean, that, that in itself is, is enough to make you have to recuse yourself because you don't even know what you have. Right. The I mean, timing of it was, question, was quite um, deliberate, I think. It's hostile. Do you attend all of these meetings? I attend most of the ZBA meetings, correct. Okay. So, I mean, to me, if that happened again, I would think you would have to say, well, this whole thing needs a 15, 20 Yes. Mm -hmm. No. We need. We need. We need some procedures. I will and say frankly, if I would have gotten the feedback that I got from my personal attorney mm -hmm. about the lawsuit, I probably would have stayed in the meeting. Right. But I didn't get that. Feedback. Well, I think. Can we all agree then? Because we said this is a workshop. We're not voting on anything. But can we agree that as a body, that if this happens again, that we immediately take a at like a 30 minute recess yes. to just reset. 
mm -hmm. because I know where Maggie's. I was as the this that was my first meeting to chair. I've right. chaired appraisal review board, so it wasn't my this it wasn't my first meeting to chair, but it was my first meeting of ZBA, right. and so I was kind of like. Then later, I was aggravated at myself for not, as the chair, saying we need to recess this for 30 minutes or we need to post, we need a vote to postpone. Well, definitely you as the chair have that discretion. I know, yeah. and I, I knew that, and I, it aggravated, I was aggravated at myself that I didn't use that, the pow that power, mm -hmm. so, because I know what it did to, I know what it did to me. I can just imagine what it did to them as being the people that were served with the lawsuit, mm -hmm. so, um, I think we can at least agree that if it happens again, we at least do a 30 minute recess. I think 15 is a little short, just I think 30 I mean, minutes. I think we to need just, 30 minutes mm -hmm. to gather our thoughts and, and just kind of. Right, and if it means postponing the meeting till the next month, then we as a board have that authority to postpone that meeting. Well, how do you gather your thoughts when you can't talk to each other? Well, but you can well, talk to the attorney. That's why I said, if he could have or you could have called your attorney. He looked at it. Yeah, and he did say he, he should he could stay, but it's just what it does to you, like Maggie said, mentally. It, you're just yeah. you're. I, I don't know if I could have gotten in touch with my uh, personal attorney at that in thirty time. minutes. Just so could it, to any postpone. member of the board request a postponement of the meeting? Can any member of the board request a postponement of the meeting? Yes, well, that's it is my a question. public hearing, uh -huh. and we've had it posted. So that's that's my only hesitation um, as far as but well, if, canceling them. Uh, well, now the only thing that we could do, and I hate to say it like that, I mean, we could have enough that there wasn't a quorum. That's right. Well, and in reality, the chair would decide if if there could be a postponement of the meeting. I mean, the chair would decide if, if a motion was made. Right, if everybody started, if the people served with the papers left then and I didn't have a quorum, then I would have to adjourn for lack of right. quorum. Right, I mean, yeah, definitely. If there wasn't okay. a quorum present, then uh, you couldn't meet, I mean, okay. by law. Right. Part of my question is, you know, do I need to have But that's not the outcome, attorney? that's not the outcome we want because, because that lets the person that's serving the papers or that started the um, lawsuit, that lets them win. They've affected the, the process. That's true, ma'am. Mm -hmm. We, we want a postponement that's long enough for the people that are served to feel comfortable either recusing or continuing. Mm -hmm. When you say we can't... In my opinion. When we, we can't talk, it seemed like um, that they could have at least let everybody else know, hey, we've been served this. Yeah, I didn't we know, what, know it what it is. Mm -hmm. um, um, so we should at least be able to talk about that. I mean because that's something that's going to affect well, the proceedings. The Open Meetings Act may yeah. uh, preclude that kind of discussion from the board at that time. It's not on the agenda. Uh, and so you're, you're basically limited to what to discuss amongst yourselves, um, anything that's on the agenda. It's gotta be stated on the agenda, so. What kind of legal protection do we have from the city for serving on a board like this? So uh, TML, we have insurance coverage through TML for any kind of claims. And in fact, uh, Mr. King and Ms. Uh, Forbes were notified and let, we let them know that we filed a claim with TML. Council was assigned, but uh, yeah, what happened was that uh, the plaintiff uh, went and got a, a, a local attorney and I had communications with him after that time period um, and basically talk to him like you need to get rid of the you know dismiss these and he, and he did he, he dismissed all of them okay. um, and that was before the answer date was due for from uh, this so the the council that was appointed by TML to represent Mr. King and Ms. Forbes didn't even have to make an appearance in the case well you should you know speak to their client I mean in the litigious society that we live in I mean Mm -hmm. Any of them could be sued well, at any time. Yeah, time and we do have coverage for that. Okay. Yeah, through TML. Well, I think. But I, I, I want to make it clear, though, that we, neither Maggie nor I, were notified quickly that we would be covered under the TML uh, legal counsel. Okay. Maggie, is that not correct? 
Yeah, we had to poke around and I had to call the city council and and get some clarification. And it, it took at least a week for the decision to be made that we were covered. I'm glad it's been made so we all know now, but it, it, it was a week. It wasn't a very fun week. So even though it was dismissed, it was not pleasant. And <laughs> anyway. Just a minute. Uh, I was here Sally Ann was speaking. Would you? Well, I can't say whether they're covered. I'm not. I'm not the insurance carrier. I make the claim to the insurance carrier, and they assign coverage. And that's. I did that the very next day. I mean, so. But the I claim was you filed. Communicate you know, that to us. To I communicated it with you with your counsel. Yes, I did. But I think what and Sally Ann was saying. The very next did you day. Communication the very next day. I, I, spoke, I spoke with Tanner the very next day, Mr. King. Maggie, did you get communication the very next day? No, I did not. Thank you. I think what Sally Ann, tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, you thought that we should have known that night, right then. Yeah, he could yeah. have looked over it and said whatever we, and I understand that you might not have known if you had the authority to do that or not, but I do think that moving forward, I think we just know right now, whatever, and, he, and all of us serve on a lot of boards. We're all active in our community. We want what's best for Nacogdoches. Correct. I think going forward, anything we are on, if anybody is served with a lawsuit, you immediately stop the meeting and you just have at least a 30 minute recess. If not, you've realized that one avenue is if people leave, then you don't have a quorum. So, you know, I'm not advising people to do that. I'm just saying that if, the, if you're not here, we don't have a quorum. Correct. I mean, if we don't have a quorum, we can't act. Right. Okay. So do you think moving is forward? It, would it be possible? I'm sorry, go ahead. Do you, I was just gonna say. Um, would it be possible to hold an executive meeting right at that moment? So could that we, we go could into go executive in a session? and discuss it? We could, we did, we'd have to make that announcement. Only if it's on the agenda, right? If there's an executive session on the agenda, we can. Well, there's Oh, it there's, has to be on the not, agenda for us to have an executive no, session? I mean, there are, I mean, there are discussions with Plaintiff's Council, which I mean, with, with the council um, for the board or the city council or whatever it may be, uh, as an exception under the Open Meetings Act, that does not have to be specifically stated okay. on the agenda for you to go into. Uh, what have to, what has to happen is that you have to make that announcement in the mm -hmm. in the public. You have to open the public meeting. Right. You have to make the you announcement. Mm -hmm. You have to cite the exception, and then you can go into the special uh, the the executive, uh, the executive session. Then you have to come back out and reopen the meeting and close mm -hmm. the meeting. At that what time. are those exceptions? There are, there are any number of exceptions. One of those is consultation with legal counsel, uh, but you could have a personnel matter that you need to discuss. So um, in that case, in the case of the last meeting, we could have gone into an executive session to have a consultation with you. Could have. Okay. Again, you'd have to open the meeting. That, right, which we, exception. but we opened the meeting, and that's why I knew it was important to gavel in the meeting to get the man to go sit down. I mean, I right. was like, because remember, people were already rushing the podium wanting to uh, just p postpone the meeting, and I said we hadn't even gaveled in yet. One we, thing I've seen with other boards, uh, and it could be something that you might want to consider, is some people or some boards or committees have, have a consistent executive session executive on their session agenda on the agenda with the, you know, yes. on every on every agenda, just in case, you know, it may not be something like this extreme, but it may be something that, you know, comes up with regarding a contract you're, you're discussing and you need to talk to your counsel before you make a vote. So if you have that already on the agenda, that covers all your bases. But I think even if you don't okay. have it, I think there's still, you got covered so long as you go through that process that I mentioned about citing, you know, opening the meeting, citing the exception, then go into executive session and coming back out and okay. reopening the meeting at that time. Okay. Well, I think then, can we all agree that if this happens again, we'll immediately go into, open the meeting, gavel in, and then we'll go into executive session. We can then talk among our, we can talk then among ourselves without violating the Open Meetings so long, Act. Yeah. So long as I is or someone is present. present. And okay. then we can decide when we come back in whether we're going to continue the meeting or if we're going to decide that there's not a quorum. 
but make sure that the executive session is placed on the agenda. Yes. yes. You know, I guess, Amy, could you make sure from now on when you do our agendas that you always put executive session just so that always gives us that caveat yes. to do that? Usually at the end. Usually, yeah, at, the usually end. at the end. Yeah. 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 Uh, that I doesn't still, mean you have to do I it at the end. I still think that we need but. to request an officer to be at our meetings, especially, especially if we are hearing a appeal, and there's a likelihood that there be another situation like yeah. this. Yeah. Do you think that we could do that on a discretionary basis? Could that be? I hate to. Could that be up to me? as the chair, whether yeah, I request uh, that. contact. Because uh, I know from looking, if we're hearing a fence issue, we don't, I yeah. mean. Chief Weems would, would know, be the one who's mad about their fence. <laughs> <laughs> We've done a lot of fences, it yeah. seems to me people like. People are so. just mad now. Yeah, people are uh, just mad. We could just say in, um, in town hall, we, uh, depending on what was on the agenda, we just uh -huh. made sure that the officer knew what the dates of the meetings were. Uh -huh. And then we just, we conversed with them a week before the meeting to let them know, yeah, we need you or no, we don't need you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that works. Okay. And I would, yeah, I discussed that with Chief Williams we, just to, to make sure that they have somebody available, you know, just have an officer if available if, if you okay. anticipate, you know, uh, an issue, you know. Okay. I, I don't know that you need to have one at every ZBA meeting. I mean, because right. that right. may be overkill on it. You right. might have something that's not going to be Well, and there's sometimes we don't even have a meeting. We don't have an app. Right. Like today, this was, today. was perfect yeah. Yeah. to have the workshop mm -hmm. because, um, okay. I'm going to move on to Maggie. Let me, let me, oh, Mr. Shawcran. Mr. Shaw. On the, on the yes. events, uh, the, the, you know, I think that would be good if all the boards knew that that was there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I know working with the city, at the city, y'all assume that it, I, everybody would know that, but you don't. I mean, coming from where I came from, I knew that policy was there. Mm -hmm. You know, the Arizona Mission Trip, whatever, right. where it was, just having as, as a board member or something. But I, I, I think the, no. I think board members need to also understand that that's just not an automatic thing. Uh, no, and I think, but but to know that it, it is there, the the fact that we're there. So. Is that what you had, Mr. Shoffner? Okay, uh, Ms. Forbes, did you have any more to add to that, or I was going to move on to uh, item B, E B E, and then item. I'm B. ready to move on. Okay. Thank you how to propose agenda items, who decides what is submitted, and how to submit proposed items. I think the question, uh, and it, this is for you, Amy, when someone submits an appeal, we're, we were wondering who decides whether it goes to the ZBA. Does every, every time someone fills out that paperwork, does everything come to us, or who makes that decision? One would decide. Okay. Is that something, I think what Maggie was asked, and I've wondered the same thing, who who makes that decision whether we hear it or not as far as? Well, he if, determines whether the application is filled out com complete and make, meets the Okay. If everything's complete and everything is done, would there ever be a reason that y'all would not submit it on through to us? Mm. There would be Unless complete, it didn't it fall in under the... That, as long as it's right. applicable. Right. Okay, we right. were just wondering so if there might be some applications out there that we never mm -hmm. even heard because we just didn't know they even existed. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Sure. Well, that was the case. They have the to file, case, though, with in so many days, don't they? 90 days right yeah. now. Yeah, Okay. Uh, that was the case with the last one that we heard. That originally, um, it was denied to be heard by the staff. Oh, the one that we heard last month. Okay. And I think that's maybe what Maggie was asking then. She uh, Is that Mr. Blackburn, I guess, had filed that application and it was denied. And only because he wrote a letter, I think, to all of us, I was not at that meeting. Then Mr. King, from reading the, the minutes, I think he brought it up, and then that's why they thought they were targeted, because Mr. King did make the motion to hear it, and then uh, Mrs. Forbes seconded it. So I think that's where they were thinking they must have been targeted for those lawsuits. So 
so I guess we're just saying moving forward, anything that's spilled out that's coming to us, shouldn't we have the, I mean, we should have the authority to make the decision where we're, whether we're going to hear that or not. Yes. Okay. According to state law, yes. Okay. Um, then moving on, if Maggie, could, did could you? I ask one other thing on, okay. this, on this point? And, and I don't know if this is what Maggie was trying to get at or not, but like, how do we put items on the agenda? I mean, how do, how do we as board members put items on the agenda? There's nothing in our rules that tell us that. Nothing in our rules tell us who we contact, who we. There isn't currently. I looked that up. I looked it up. Give me an example of what we do. What authority well, do we do? Well, most, most uh, bylaws have something in them that say how you add items to an agenda. So, for example, you would contact the chair and say, I would like this item added to the agenda. And on that, uh, the last appeal that uh, was before this board, um, I just emailed Amy and asked her if it could be put on the agenda because I didn't know the proper procedure. I didn't know who to yeah. email. I didn't know who to contact. I didn't know okay. what to do to get it on the agenda for discussion. And we need to have some procedure for putting things on an agenda for discussion. And my suggestion is that there be a rule added to the bylaws and, and the rules for this board that tells us what we're going to do, how we do that in our procedure. My suggestion is that it would just, we would send them to the chair and then the chair would uh, forward them to Amy or whoever is that, it was toward. Uh, Nathan, from your experience with other boards, is that how items are added to an agenda? You submit yeah, it to the chair? Yes, ma'am. Um, for like D&D, I've never seen um, the Board of Adjustment add per se. That's why I was asking what the example might be. Right. Um, usually they hear the appeals and that's what... Right. Uh, well, you can I, see I what's see driving that. all of this is, is what happened yeah, two week, or last month. And I think it was appropriate, yeah, if, if we don't have an agenda, I think the intent is we would just go through, whether it's a city attorney or a city manager, to say if we put this on the agenda. But I, I would agree with that. There's nothing in this... this right now in our, in our rules and procedure that that would be done. That it goes to the, it goes to someone, either the chair or the, yeah, or, or, or okay. Because we, after we do some of these checks and amendments, we have to go back in and re-adopt uh, the okay. rules and procedures. So because we're going to be changing the, the ordinance, and so okay. that, then we can change the rules and procedures and we'll add that in at that particular time. Okay. So I would say we also need to have a time frame because since we have to have these in for posting, most of our meetings, especially if it's... Yeah, we need to have the, the, deadline. the deadline of when deadline it has to be submitted. Correct. Maggie, did that answer everything for you? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay. Moving it's on the to... the procedure. It would be nice if the procedure was spelled up in the, in the rules and procedures okay. handbook. All right. Moving on to number C, order of alternates. What is the procedure in adding alternates? I know we have... Um, Mr. Sloan, uh, Jacqueline, Sally Ann Swearingen, and Ed Poole are our alternates. How do you, Amy, is there, a, uh, is there a list on who gets called first? Yes, it's on the, <coughs> the website under government and then board ZBA. Okay. And it has the, the regular members listed okay. and then the alternates listed from who's been serving the longest to who's been serving the least. Okay. So do you know what that order is right now? It's... Yeah. I'm not sure the regulars under the alternates is Ed Poole. Who's John, first? Ed Poole. Ed Poole. Uh -huh. John Sloan. Okay. And I can't remember if, because they came in at the same time. I don't remember if it says, I, th I think Sally Ann's last. But, so it would be Jacqueline and Sally Ann. So if one of us couldn't serve, the first person you would call would be Ed? Yes. yes. Okay. And then you would call... Uh, Mr. Sloan, and then Jacqueline, and then Sally Ann Swergen. Correct. Okay. That's the order. Okay. Did Ma uh, Maggie, did that answer that for you? It answers it, but um, I think where I was headed with this is when I first read through the rules and procedures, there was no, there was no language that addressed that. And it seemed to be a case of whoever got there first just got up in the in the empty chair 
so I asked the city what is the procedure and they weren't sure and they said they said they would uh, come up with a list and and I asked them what the criteria was for ordering them and they said it's length of service and I just think that the the seating of the alternate should be objective and random rather than um, arbitrary, which is what it appears to be now. And it should also be transparent and covered in the rules and procedures. Meg, does the state law uh, say anything about uh, the numbering of the uh, alternates? Maggie? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Yes, did the state law say anything about the numbering of the alternates? I know it said no. that, that they no. would be no, it does numbered, not. but it it's, doesn't It's really silent do, on that. It really doesn't say how they will be numbered. Mr. Right. Dietrich, it in, does not. in uh, revising our rules and procedures, can we put that in there, with the, that the order of the alternates will be according to what's on the website, how they're listed, just so that we know who's next? Okay. Yeah, when, right. when I first came on this board, the alternates were not numbered. They are now. Okay. But they were not. But it, it's the criteria for numbering them that I'm that I'm questioning, I'm, and I think that the criteria for ordering them should be transparent and it should be random or objective. So when you're saying random, you're saying their all their names should be put in a in a hat and then drawn out. Well, if that's what we want to do, but but it it's, it needs to be objective with respect to the makeup of the alternate pool. Yeah, the way it is now. That, that's just my opinion. I, the I just want to discuss now, it now. That would be one. The first alternate would be uh, pretty much on every chosen every time. Um, board members, this is. Uh, I don't know if it has to be like that or once. But. Maggie, we were going to represent, mis uh, recognize Mr. New. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and again, yes. Executive Thank Director you. of Development Infrastructure, I'll be providing uh, support for the foreseeable future to this group as well as um, our other development counterparts. In my in my past, in Leander and in College Station, the Board of Adjustment, when there were council made appointments to those boards, when they appointed alternates, they would appoint alternates in ranking order. So they would appoint a first alternate, a second alternate, a third alternate. And okay. it's not addressed in the Texas Open Government Code in, in that way, but that's how those councils had done it, and it would be a, I think uh, it would be could be a council discretion item in future appointments. Currently, that's not how that's addressed, but I'm presenting that to you as, okay. as a, a way that other cities have done it. Thank you very much. Okay. I actually, I think that would, I'm not so sure, Mr. Dietrich, I know you're doing a lot of this with all the other boards. It might help clarification on all the other boards to call it first alternate, second alternate third and fourth, just so that there's uniformity in how we select alternates for any board for the city. Well, that's what the commissioners do. They, they, the mayor has that right to offer. Okay. Well, we're, at least we're having this discussion. That's what this was for, for us to all just get all <coughs> more on the same page. Um, all right, Maggie, number, uh, item D is new state laws, chapter 211. Review how the new state laws may impact the board's rules and procedures, as well as discuss if the ordinance and state law are not in agreement. Do you want to speak to that? Well, with, I can try to speak to it. It's probably something Nathan will want to weigh in on or, or uh, Mr. New. In reading 211, 009 and 008, it says that it taught, it discusses who can bring an appeal and the timeline, and it says that if it's a specific project, it has to be the applicant or someone with, with property within 200 feet, and they only have 20 days. Now, I, be, I may be misunderstanding that reading, but my question is, does would that apply to, for example, the case we just heard? or does our city code um, override that with the 90 days? Also, does the person have to live, you know, have property within 200 feet? Okay, Mr. If uh, it's not a specific, yeah, go ahead. Mr. Sorry. Dietrich was gonna uh, 
address that. Yeah, um, Nathan, okay. Nathan here, um, third party uh, planning consultant. I'm sorry, I just had it open here. So yes, it does say those things and uh, the 20 days would not be more stringent actually, or the 90 days would not be more stringent. So no, it would stay at 20. Um, we would be following that rule and regulation. Now when it comes to saying who needs to do or, or who could be aggrieved, um, yes, and I think that you are correct is that it recommends the people that would be within that buffering distance, you know, because local government code states that 200 feet is the minimum that you, you notify folks. There are other people that we put more stringent standards on, like 300 feet, I believe we do it here, or 500 feet. I'm sorry, we do it 500 feet here, right? For notification. For notification, yeah. But I think right after that same in here, I'm trying to find the exact words, but the way that they write these state laws, it's all kind of garbled like this. So, but. I believe right after it says, or um, a person representing that person that is aggrieved. So really, technically, it could be anybody that shows up that's aggrieved. But I think they're, what they're trying to say, say here in these words, and again, I don't want to put words into other people's mouths of the author, but I think the people that are being um, immediately affected, right? Mm -hmm. That's that, Those are the people they want. Or, because anyone could walk into the doors and say, I'm aggrieved. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think they're trying to keep things reasonable when it comes down to that. Um, can I ask you a question on yeah. the 90 and 20 days? Yes, sir. I, I'm not understanding something. You said now our ordinance says 90 days. It currently says 90 days. Yes, okay. The state ordinance says 20 days. But our ordinance, you said the 20 days was the least stringent. No, the 20 yeah. days is the most stringent. What? Is the most stringent, yes, sir. Yeah, the 20 is most. You is the most 20 stringent. is the most. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Um, but what you said, we would go with the most stringent. Yes, sir. So we no longer are, are on the 90 days. Well, technically, I think if we if we were to enforce that here, I think we would be okay. This is more of a legal question. Uh, I would say our ordinance says one thing, but there is there is something that we know that is out there. Mm -hmm. Should we should we turn a blind eye to it? My my response would be no. But what you said earlier is that the city ordinance cannot be more stringent than the state's ordinance. And we're not. No, it may it may be more stringent. Oh, uh, you can, can be more stringent. Yes, sir. So we could be 10 days. Correct. Yes, that's correct. But okay. because it's 90 days, we're less stringent. Right. Yeah. But I would say that depends on whose perspective you're taking. True. Yeah, I, I, I mean, if, I, you're I, taking, if you're taking the landowner's perspective, yes. But if you're taking the person who may be the uh, person that would be filing an appeal, then that 20 days is much more than the 90 days. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not, I'm not following, but... Um, I think Jerry was had something he might want to say. Did you want to speak to this, Mr. Baker? I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's why we're here for a workshop. Yes. Right? Yeah, this is I trying wanted, to be in kind of give you a, a little bit of history. Um, so our current ordinance is based on the prior... Um, version of 211.09, I think, um, the one that says the 90 days. So at that time, and I wish I had it in front of me, um, I have it on my computer up in the office, but at that time, what the, uh, what the legislature had passed is what you see in our current ordinance. It, but it said basically a reasonable time, and it left it up to the local jurisdictions to determine what a reasonable period of time was. And the city and I could just determine that to be 90 days. Well, what happened is in 2019, there was a House bill was passed that basically changed that, that statute. Um, and it, it reduced that. It took away the reasonable time language completely out mm -hmm. of the statute and replaced it with 20 days. So at that time... Um, so that, that was five years ago. That was five years ago. 
and Nacogdoches just never changed That's with. Correct. And do you know that house bill number? I have it right here. Just one second. What is it? Twenty-four ninety-seven. Effective September first, twenty-nineteen. <coughs> and so we've never changed it to the ninety. I mean, to twenty days. So and so Monday we have a meeting with PNC, mm -hmm. and included in that meeting is to update our that that particular part of our ordinance to mirror what's in the uh, state code. Which seems strange to me that that it ha affects appeals that come to us, but PNZ is changing is making a recommendation for changing the ordinance. Well, by law, any kind of zoning regulation first has to go through PNC for recommendation to city council for it to be approved. And never comes to us. No, because we, no, fact, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even that. know that this was going on if we hadn't heard it. No, but we wouldn't have any jurisdiction for that. Yeah, historically yeah. what's happened is that it was just P and Z yeah. and city council making those determinations. When we looked at this and we were like, well, it probably would be a best, a better practice if we included you guys. Now you're, you're not a, a recommending body, but you can still give your input, right? But you're, again, not from that legislative process, that's not for, uh, for you to determine. Um, those, those changes to the text are through planning and zoning and through you at the city council. But you said we're not a recommending body, but my recollection is that we can make recommendations to the city council. And then th that's why we, we included you in this, um, what did we call it at the beginning of the meeting? Yeah, so the ordinance. So what we thought was is that, yeah, you guys are here, you guys talk about zoning, you mm -hmm. can do all those things. Why shouldn't you be a part of it? And so that's why we added you. Originally, mm -hmm. it was just planning, zoning, and city council. Okay. Um, Maggie, does that answer your question on uh, how did the new state laws impact our current ordinances? Kind of. Okay. Kind of. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like we really don't have, I mean, that's not our purview to do that. Correct? Correct. Okay, that's not our purview to do that. That's for planning and zoning and the city council. But there's nothing that says that you can't be a part of it. And so right, yeah, I understand that. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Even though when it goes to the subcommittee, we'll make a recommendation, but it will still have to go to PNZ and then on the council right. for those certain Okay. Um, all right, did, you, did anybody have anything else before we move on? Okay. F is discussed the possibility, we've kind of covered some of this, of outside counsel for the Zoning Board of Adjustment as requested by board, board member Forbes, including potential conflict of interest using the city attorney. And does the Zoning Board of Adjustment have a budget that can be used for consultation with an independent attorney? And when is an independent attorney needed to be used in? And I think, Maggie, you know, we covered this when Mr. Dietrich was giving his presentation. And I think we agreed that we would like to seek outside counsel on the way we're to proceed with some of these things. I would just like someone to read over what all we've got and see if we are in rowing the boat in the same direction. Is if that's and I think uh, Mayor, Mrs. Bentley expressed that she was she thought that we needed that before she left. Um, what is the consensus of Mr. Ke what do you think, Mr. Schaffner? Do we need to? Make sure that we're doing it correctly. Okay. Okay. And Jacqueline is now seated. Okay. Um, I think we will, I will try to see what, I mean, I'll do some investigation into where, what, what <coughs> avenue we, we seek on that. Um, I did have a question. I also have on here discussion and establishment of guidelines regarding participation by Zoom. And that was an item agenda that I submitted. Um, and I've, I have been told that that has changed. Um, I had asked to join one of the meetings by Zoom. And uh, Amy told me that, Mr. Baker, that you had recommended, or you had said that I could join, but I couldn't vote. But, yeah, I have it in an email. Yeah. Yeah, no, I have it in an email where she said I could join, but I wouldn't be able to vote. And I said, well, if I can't vote, well, then I, I won't join. But I have, I mean, I have the email. And so... 
I've been told that that's not correct. That I mean, I've, I've know now that there's other boards that they participated by Zoom and were able to vote. Well, if there was miscommunication, I apologize. What I guess the point okay. that was supposed to be made was that in order for the somebody to participate, per, participate, excuse me, via Zoom, there has to be a quorum present. Right. So that means that four members have to be present here for ZBA. They have to be physically present here. And uh -huh. then you can participate, have someone participate by Zoom. But if we have a fifth person here, like an alternate, then we have, you know, five members okay. serving. Okay. And, and maybe uh, that's, that was the, uh, the communication. If we have five members serving on the board at that time, an alternate serving in your spot, then that's the, that's the five that would be voting on that item. Okay, so even if I r remote it in, I wouldn't have a vote. So, it would so you could remote in, let's uh -huh. say there's four present okay. up here. We don't have an alternate, and you're remoting in. Uh -huh. You could vote at that time. For that meeting, Correct. there were there were four members okay. here. And, uh, okay, because, I mean, I have Rhonda. I just spoke with Nathan. We would prefer to have one of the four alternates attend the in-person meeting due to we're required to have four people attend in person to make up a quorum. Yes. And then if another member does not show up, we will have to cancel the meeting. If we didn't have a quorum, we would have to cancel Okay, and then just as Jerry, our city attorney, did say you could remote in but would not be able to vote. If we had five available. If five available here, uh -huh. four active members and one alternate uh -huh. that's, on the, that's actually serving at that meeting, uh -huh. then you wouldn't be able to vote calling that. Because you'd, ha you'd have six members. Because you'd have six that. members. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I was not So clear. I apologize for the miscommunication. Yeah. That's, what that, that's what that was intended. So if we have five members of mm -hmm. the uh, ZBA serving at that meeting, uh -huh. that's all we can have voting on that particular item. But if there's four members that are present, we don't have another alternate here, and you're zooming in, uh -huh. clearly you have that right to vote at that time. Yes. But okay. if – I think it, what happened in this case was that um, an alternate was called and brought in, but we still had four people here, so that – not accounting that alternate. So you could have remoted into that meeting. And participated in voting because there was only four people. And there were four people. There were four people. There were four people. There was only four. But an alternate showed up in your place. Oh, okay. So there was five. So there was five. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay. But, I just wanted. To but but that's that's not the issue. The issue is the reason the alternate was here was because she was told that she could not zoom into the meeting. That's the only yeah, that's the true. Yeah, because they said that they would just get an alternate for me. That's the only reason the alternate was here. When in reality, she could have zoomed into that meeting. Is that correct? Well, if the alternate was present, there were five people there. I know, but they I called. Mean, they that, called they the alternate. They called the alternate. Because see, I was prepared to zoom in. I mean, I. I, I don't know. There's. I wasn't involved in that communication. In April, if it was April, if it was April, I was in Kentucky, and I was in in a location. That I could have, I mean, I wouldn't, I was at my sister's house, so I could have okay, remoted in. Yeah. Okay. But that's yeah. not, what, what you'd rather is not yeah. the case. That, that's not what, I, I would rather not be here all right, at all. Then this, right, right, okay. Exactly. Okay. But if she can attend, and she she expressed that she would attend, yeah, by I understand yeah. that. But it's, sometimes it's better to have you know if you're talking to somebody by phone, and it's some, easier to let somebody in your house. Sometimes it's also better not to have the alternate show up. It depends on who the alternate is and what the case is. Could it be the alternate? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying maybe the alternate was picked to show up. I don't think we even need an alternate for y'all. I'm just saying. Okay. Yes, Jacqueline. Yes, Jacqueline. Okay. Yeah. As an alternate, um, I'd like to come to the meetings, whether I'm called or not, to sit in to yeah. so that I know what's going on in case I am called. So can I come to the meeting and yes. not be called? Yes. Okay. Yes. These meetings are open to the They're public. Open to the public. Okay. Anybody can come. Okay. Anybody can you come. Sure you want to come? The last <laughs> right. time you got drug up here. I have one last thing that I want to ask. Um, 
we were at a meeting and there was only four people here and we could not get a hold of any other alternates. And I remember, Amy, you had offered the lady, since there was only four of us here, that we could postpone the meeting because it would take a unanimous vote of all of us to grant or deny her appeal. It was a, the lady was asking for a duplex. I remember the lady, she was, it was last year. And there was only four people here and you told her she had that, she could do that. So Olivia gaveled it in. The lady said she would rather not do that. She would rather there be five up here because she knew it would take four, we'd have to be unanimous to grant it or to deny it, I guess is what I'm. And so you had offered her to come back that we could do this later because there was no, it was only going to be four. That was before your time, Jerry. Um, and I think that has to be a procedural question. What I'm saying is that last time to, last month, it wound up by the time they recused themselves, we only had four people sitting up here. Well, Jeff didn't even argue until we could see how No, that's fine. Yes, yeah, she was here, but there were still only four of us. There was no more alternates. I, mean, well, I know, but it's the same situation. I'm wondering if we should have said, look, this has to be, it has to be unanimous. Or, I don't, I'm going to have to go back and look at the video because I don't remember. I don't, maybe I don't recall that. Okay. And if I said that, then that would be a mistake for me. Okay. Oh, I know, I'm saying that. I'm just saying, what do we do? Then that, that, of course, all of that, that last meeting had everybody, I mean, myself as well. And I thought when I got in my car, I was like, you know what? We only had four people present, there was only four on this up here. And I remember from before when there was only four, the lady asked for it to be postponed where she knew she would have five people. And you said that you were wearing a duplex? I believe it was a duplex. Last year. It was last year. I'm, I can probably, I might be able to go back through some of the stuff and figure out which one. But I just know moving forward, we need some continuity in that. That if there's just four, do you offer them that? Should we postponed it so that we would have, because we didn't. Yeah, let's just look it up because there might have been other circumstances that were happening. I believe it does say that they can be rescheduled. Well, and I think that was the deal. Either we voted to reschedule. I was, Olivia was the chair. And I just remember we barely walked in here and we said, well, that's the fastest meeting we've ever had. And it, because it was, we were literally five minutes. Do what? Oh, that was his not the fastest meeting. Fast. Well, this isn't to me. It's a workshop. That's what this is for. I wanted us to be able to discuss things and not have a, you know. So if you a, take council meetings, y'all take council meetings, how much advance do you give Amy? She usually sends it out and asks if you're going to be able to attend, and we just say yes or no. Most of the time we know, unless I guess something comes up and you get sick that day, you know. And then that's when she starts calling alternates, from what I understand, in the order. Now we know that we'll be in the order that they are on the website. Right. They're alphabetical. Yeah. Oh, they're in alphabetical order? Yeah. Oh, Poole, Sloan. What's the, your last name, Jacqueline? The yeah. alternates are in the order of who okay. has and been on the board said, the long from Yeah, and then what she got from the city secretary. Okay. Okay. Well, I think Ed's the only one that had been on here before the, the three of these, correct? Okay, I didn't remember you, I guess, I thought we had, um, I didn't remember Mr. Sloan being appointed last year. Yeah, okay. I've been for a long time ago. Before, okay. Okay. Well, I know Ed was on when I was on the first time. When I came on th this time, no, Ed was going off as chair. And Olivia came, came on as she was voted as chair. She was on the board, but she was chair then. And then he was before my time, right before my time, I guess, where he did a, or I guess he was alternate. I don't, he was alternate when I was on. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, does anybody have anything else? Anything else? Did he, did, I mean, I know we're asking y'all questions, so I know you don't have any questions of us. Um, The, the order here. Um, I did want to verify with the board that these items, I guess, have been requested at least for follow up, whether in a future meeting as part of the subcommittee yeah. um, consideration or just staff communication with board members. So far, as part of this workshop, you've asked for clarification on rules for board members requesting meeting agenda items. You've asked for clarification, and some of this can be in the rules and procedures updates if that, mm -hmm. if that occurs again. Uh, clarification on consideration of items beyond the scope of the zoning ordinance. I heard that was discussed. Um, order of alternate members and the procedures for assigning alternate members or bringing alternate members, members into a meeting to vote. Clarification on outside or council representation, and you gave specific examples of what that might look like. Uh, virtual participation clarification, um, just that procedure. And we've kind of discussed it here, but we can clarify. Staff can give you some specific direction in writing or something to propose for rules or procedure changes. And then reasons uh, for postponement of meeting items that was most recently discussed. So did I miss anything there? As, as I think that up? did that pretty well follow. Uh, that's a good recap of what we discussed. Okay. I think so. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our meeting is uh, adjourned mm -hmm. or workshop. <laughs> uh, it is 613. So none of us can be friends.